need any monitors, actually. If you want to just cut the monitors out entirely, that would just be fine. For everything. For everything, yeah. You don't want to use our I don't need anything in my monitor. I'm just... No, I'm used to the really primitive kind of thing. There's a song I co-wrote with George Bush. We got a situation and it calls for a solution that upholds our domination of the planet. We're gonna make our keys and we're gonna make it well. And if you don't like our logic, We'll use impeccable intelligence from any country in the world As long as we all see eye to eye And if we don't find quite what we need We know what to do Just look into the camera and lie It's Operation Iraqi Liberation Tell me, what does that spell? Operation Iraqi Liberation for several hours. Seems like you think more guitars than me, so I'll go just trust you on it. Sounds like the vocals are louder than the guitar. I'm supposed to say annoying things like that. That's a good job. Okay, let's go. Uh, we'll lie about the missiles and the nuclear research. We'll lie about uranium. We'll build military bases and smile for reporters as we give away bubblegum. His connections with the Saudis will lie about 911. We'll lie about the Baptist their connections to Al Qaeda because we know there's none. It's Operation Iraqi Liberation. Tell me, what does that spell? Operation Iraqi Liberation. Oh. We didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. This is a true story about some early veterans against another war who took, uh, who took uh, being against the war just a step further than most uh, other veterans have been willing to go. Join the other side. My name is John Ryan. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my duty to go. Enter the army and slot across Texas to join in the war against Mexico. And it was there in the pueblos and hillsides that I saw the mistake I had made. Part of a conquering army with the morals of a bayonet blade. And I missed all these poor dying Catholics, screaming children, the burning stench of it all. Myself and 200 Irishmen decided to rise to the call. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican. 
place with Erin Goldra. Right with the harp and the shamrock and the retired Padre Publica. Just 15 years after Wolf Tone, 5,000 miles away, the Yanks call us a legion of strangers. Where their volunteers were raping the nuns In Monterey and Cerro Gordo We fought on as Ireland's sons We were the red-headed fighters for freedom Midst these brown-skinned women and men Side by side we fought against tyranny And I dare say we do it again From Dublin City to San Diego We witnessed freedom Of 
your cousin after torture. Mortality and its glitter in shopping malls. When the fat men in their mansions see that you don't want peace. Did you wonder what they mean? As he sat amidst the sentience of the darkness. In the shattered city of the dream. Did they even give your parents warning? Before they blew the windows out with shells. As you hid inside the high school basement. Amidst the ring of church bells. As you watched your teacher crumble by the doorway. And in England, they were toasting to the queen. You were so far from the thoughts of so many. Huddled in the city of June. What went through your mind on that day at the sight of your mother's vacant eyes? As she lay still among the rubble beneath the blue middle stern skies, as you stood upon this bulldozed building beside the settlements and their hills of green as your tears gave way to grim determination of its rules of the city of doom. Why should anybody wonder as you stepped on board the crowd and bus across the green line and you reached inside your jacket for the cord. Were you thinking of your neighbor's buried bodies as you made the stage for the scene? As you set off the explosives that were strapped around your waist? Were you thinking of the city of Jane? Anybody wants to buy me a bottle of IPA or some kind, I will be very glad. I get up here and start making demands. <laughs> Let's see here. Well, I've been writing children's songs lately. I'm going to subject you to one now. Maybe some of you have children. I'm recording a children's album. I went outside one day and a man was standing there. He had a great big beard and lots and lots of hair. He said, won't you come down to the shore and join my jolly crew? We'll wander around the world beneath the skies of blue. We'll sail upon the seven seas, travel near and far. Take from the rich and give to the poor and say har, 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 har. We'll go out on the ocean. And when the coast is clear, we'll eat birthday cake each day of the year. We'll land on a little island, then we'll form a choir, blow on whistles and kazoos, and dance around the fire. We'll sail upon the seven seas, travel near and far. Take from the rich and give to the poor and say har, 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 har. If we see the Navy, we will shout with pride. We are scary, hairy pirates, so you better run and hide. We'll stamp our feet up on the floor and our peg legs too. We'll take your stolen treasure, cause that's what pirates do. We'll sail on the seven seas, travel near and far. Take from the rich and give to the poor and say har, 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 har. We'll sail on the seven seas, travel near and far. Take from the rich and give to the poor and say har, har, har.
2005. You there, Kate Casey? I was there on the last day, and Hurricane Katrina hit, and, and everybody was uh, changing their plans to tour around the country and going to speaking tours and stuff, and packing buses full of food and medical supplies and heading to Louisiana. And then I uh, got on a plane from Houston to uh, Beirut, and uh, on the way from Houston to, to Milan, on the way to Beirut, I was I happened to be sitting next to a guy who uh, who, who bombed uh, a, a friend of mine's cousin in Libya in 1986. And he was talking about his 22 years in the army, how proud he was of uh, everything he'd done, and I, and I was asking him, well, what he had done? And, well, he, one of his proud moments was in 1986 when he bombed Libya. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to visit a woman whose cousin was killed in that bombing. Uh, she lived next to Gaddafi. And then he showed up.
disgrace When I looked me in the mirror I didn't recognize my face I wasn't home too long Before the time that I took ill It was like the air was thick as mud And I ain't enough to kill I didn't know I'd been fighting in a nuclear war The you was in my blood And I was knocking on death's door I can't tell you how it felt To be betrayed at every turn Like the earth was spinning backwards Like my heart began to burn Like I had to do something While I still had the strength to stand While I still could run to the machine gun in my hand Take some of them fuckers with me, I'll spare you the details. I did what had to do. There's a boardroom blown to hell, and soon I will need you. You can say I've lost it, you can say that I'm insane, but may no one ever say that my death was in vain. I joined the army. When high school is through, I didn't know what else to do. Here. There's been a lot of trials going on in Portland uh, lately, around in the Northwest generally, uh, having to do with people that have uh, committed acts of arson. And I think they're wonderful. And uh, I think there's a lot of. Uh, I think that building a Walmart is an act of eco terrorism. And. Uh, and burning down a Walmart is an act of liberation, and it's something that needs to be happening, it needs to happen. There's thousands of Walmarts in this country that desperately need to burn down, to get burned down. I don't care how they get burned down, legally or illegally, I couldn't care less, because we got a planet to save here. And, uh, but this song isn't about that, actually. It's about my friend Rod Coronado, who, uh, who was uh, facing a 25-year prison sentence for giving a speech. And, uh, and this is a Clinton-era law, yay for the Democrats, Clinton-era law that, uh, that says if you describe an incendiary device with the intention that somebody else should, should use that device for the purposes of animal or environmental liberation, you are an eco-terrorist just for speaking and should serve a minimum mandatory 25-year prison sentence. But he was found, uh, it was 9-3, to three, uh, hung jury in favor of acquittal. But uh, they could, they could uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Try it again, you know, retry, retrial. If you sing the chorus to this song, you could face a 25-year prison sentence. And, um, and if you don't sing the chorus to this song, my guess is that when you get subpoenaed to the grand jury, they're not going to ask you, were you singing along? They're going to ask you, who else was in the room? So you can be prepared for that question. And, uh, you know, all those white people went to the like, it was dark, you know. Robbie Coronado was arrested for a speech that he gave one evening by the San Diego Beach. He stated his opinions, they sounded just like mine. Now they want to put him behind bars till 2029. The prosecutor said the problem was the speech of showed intent. I couldn't figure out exactly what that meant. You can't describe it, actually say you thought that it was swell. So what'll happen when we sing this? Who the heck can tell? But we don't like the condo and we're gonna burn.
we raise your fists and catter wall. If we fight together, they can't arrest us all. Cause we don't like the Walmart and we're gonna burn it down. Corporate terrorists drive them out of town. We'll bring a lot of gasoline, pour it on the floor, light a match, say a prayer, and run right out the door, burn it down. Burn it down. We're going to burn it down. Nothing's changed for me. When I see your face, I see the dawn. And like you, it's filled with grace. When I look into your eyes, I see all that I have known. I see the red sunrise and the kindness you have shown. Nothing's changed for me. Now when I think about those days, I feel a tremble in my knee. My impression never fades. Oh, to touch your golden skin and the fullness of your smile. I be more the state I'm in, and I love you all the while. Cause nothing's changed for me. And like everybody here, I'm so glad that you could me. It's so good to have you here. For your words I laugh and cry. And as I look around, I'm sure I'm surrounded by your lovers. Only one of many more. Nothing's changed for me. I still yearn for your embrace. Sometimes I close my eyes. Then I gaze upon your face. I know everything must end. But I remember our last kiss. I recall your parting glance. And there's so much more I miss. Cause nothing's changed for me. Except you went away. You're moving on, and I'm stuck in yesterday. So I'll wish you all that's good, and I'll make a toast for you. For all the places you may travel, for whatever you may do. Cause nothing's changed for me. I'm still in love so much, I know I'll be okay. But I miss your gentle touch. There are songs for victories, songs for things that fall apart. This is just a song for my broken heart. Well, here's, uh, you know, I love, uh, I heard uh, Country Joe McDonald perform uh, quite a, a fair number of times, and uh, he always does this thing where he, like, like if he's performing in People's Park in, uh, in Berkeley, he'll always ask people, uh, how many veterans do we have out there? And then he'll get a whole bunch of people saying, yeah, and then he'll say, how many draft dodgers do we have out there? And inevitably, it's always about three times as many people. Yeah! <laughs> you think you know where he's going with the veteran thing, maybe, you know, and then, then he throws that in. This is a song by Phil Oaks from 1963. <laughs> what about just tip? 
typical American boy from a typical American town. I believe in God and Senator Dunn and keeping old Castro down. And when it came my time to serve, I knew better dead than red. But when I got to my old grad board, but this is what I said. Tired to only 18, I got a rupture to clean and always carry a purse. I got eyes like a bat, my feet are flat, my ass was getting worse. Oh, think of my career, my sweet idea. Poor old invalid here, besides I ain't no fool. I'm going to school and I'm working in a defense plan. I got a disc in disc and a racked up back. I'm allergic to flowers and bugs. When the bombshell hits, get it when it fits. I'm addicted to a thousand drugs. I got the weakness woes. I can't touch my toes. I can hardly reach my knees. And if the enemy came close to me, I'd probably start to sneeze. Sorry, I'm only 18. I got ruptured spleen and I've always carried a purse. I got eyes like a bat. My feet are flat. My asthma's getting worse. Oh, they feel like a mirror. My poor old invalid here, besides I ain't no fool, I'm going to school and I'm working in an event plan. Spleen and always carry a purse. I got eyes like a bat, my feet are flat, my asthma's getting worse. Oh, think of my career, my sweet idea, my poor old invalid aunt. Besides, I ain't no fool, I'm going to school and I'm working in a defense plan. Well, I got a couple more for you. I know there's at least one Christian in this crowd here, and this is for her. And, uh, there's, uh, I won't mention any names. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Just joking. Um, as they, uh, I was, uh, I mean, there's a lot of Christians in the world, and, and, a, lot, and, and a lot of them are, are really wonderful folks. Actually, probably most of them are. Um, but uh, here in this country, it's a mixed bag. And uh, I lived in Houston for some years, where it's a, a more of a mixed bag. And, um, you know, you got your liberation theologians and Catholic workers and stuff in Houston, too. But you got a lot of other people. You got these churches that have like 20 or 30,000 people coming every Sunday to hear about like how all, everybody else is going to hell and stuff like that. And how they should give all their money to so and so. And um, so I was in the organic vegetable section of the whole, of the whole foods market in uh, Houston. And um, I was wearing my favorite t-shirt, which I used to have five of. I used to wear them on every day of the week. I'd take a break on the weekends. But it was my sociological experiment, Monday through Friday. I'd wear a picture of George Bush on my chest. And, and it had, in big letters, it said, International Terrorist. And um, about 15 out of 16 interactions were positive, And one in 16 was negative. And um, on the average, there were also people that walked by and gave looks that were kind of hard to decipher. But of the ones that gave like positive, like, I want to get that t-shirt, or that's wonderful, or I feel so good, or whatever, you know, there's about 15 out of 16. And then there would be occasionally, you know, like, like in the airports, for example, there would be like, all the TSA workers would be like, yeah, all right, I don't, you know, I don't like the president either. And the Starbucks workers would be like, and sometimes you'd notice like you could, you could help encourage sort of racial tension because it'd be like, Okay, all the white people, are, some of the white people are thinking, I like the president, but I know that most of my, all of my co-workers of color don't, and um, I'm not sure what to say here, and so they'd stay quiet, and, and me and and all other, other co-workers would be like, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but then there'd be like, inevitably, some businessman, always a white businessman in a suit, usually, in the airports, there are always white men in a suit, who would say like, you jackass, or something like that, and then clutches, uh, you know, it would always be like a G-rated, G-rated swear word, and then he clutches his laptop and run, you know, like, I might have dented or something. But once it was uh, this elderly gentleman in the Whole Foods Market, he came up to me and he was shaking with what I assume was rage, unless it was a medical disorder. And he was pointing at the picture of George Bush and he was saying, he's a man of God, he's a man of God. And it um, uh, freaked me out and I wrote this song for him that night. <laughs> I've seen you in the streets, and that 
at your political conventions, talking of your crusades, talking of your nation, and other things too terrible to mention. And you proclaim your Christianity, you proclaim your love of God, you talk of apple pie and bomb. I just got one question and I want an answer, tell me, who would Jesus buy? Sometimes when I, I was controversial for a little bit of time, you know, you, you have to get media attention in order to be controversial. Otherwise, you're not controversial by definition. But it, um, I never really got it, but um, a little bit. I just got a little bit, just enough to almost be just barely controversial in England, not really anywhere else. Um, but uh, but they called me a, a self-loathing Jew, and. Uh, and I think that is a hilarious idea, because uh, coming from coming from people who support a nation that is filled with self-loathing Jews, to call me one, it's just you know there's some confusion here. Because when you go to the West Bank and you see Bethlehem, and you see that it's you can't see Bethlehem until you get in there, because there's a 30-foot wall surrounding the whole city, cut off all the farmland, and as you walk in there, oddly enough. Some wonderful Palestinians that I happen to know who, who run the uh, the international media uh, international Mid Middle, Middle East media center, which which everybody who goes to Bethlehem should visit. Yes, and uh, and they uh, they're somehow loosely affiliated with the Bethlehem bloggers, and uh, 
and uh, they paint it at great risk to their lives uh, on the wall, and it's still there to my knowledge. It says, Welcome to the Ghetto. They're building a wall, a wall between friends, a wall that justifies and means for their ends, a wall between sites. Rich and poor, brothers and sisters, but not so long before. Many feet thick and twenty feet high. No one can look through it and into the eye of a person you might know, to whom you might confide. Now just a stranger on the other side. A wall between water and land, so we can eat fruit and they can eat sand. A wall to make sure that our orchards will grow and our kids can get fat and not need to know of the cities in ruins and the children in fear. That your fathers and brothers. So you don't have to listen to your grandfather's ghost. They're building a wall between future and past. A wall to keep distant the chambers of gas from the bulldozer's gunships and the tears of a child. From the line. They're building a wall, and at such a cost, land, money, and safety, and all the lives lost. A wall made of brick, but bricks can be broken when the people of Zion have finally awoken and said, No more walls, no more refugees. Will someday recall before apartheid was ended? They were building a wall. band is going to come back. Um, Grant's band. I don't know, they have, must have a name other than Grant's band. They've been around 19 years and they sound to me loose change. Loose change. And they predate the really shitty documentary, I hope. Good. And they, uh... They're fantastic. Man. I love that stuff. I love good... Rock and roll bands, and uh, as opposed to bad ones. So I, um, I'm playing at the Nine Muses with the great Jim Page, who is the best songwriter in the English language, and he lives in Seattle. And uh, we're playing together a double bill at Nine Muses Pub. It's a benefit for something good, and uh, and it's I can't remember what. It's at June 4th. June 4th at the Nine Muses Pub. My website is davidrobics.com. You can hear more about that there. You can download free music. And I have uh, also CDs you can pay for, which my dentist and my oral surgeon and my landlord and my daughter all really appreciate. Even though none of them actually know it. And I hope also to see all of you at, well, as you may know, the world's biggest terrorist organization is meeting in this country this summer. And they're advertising in advance. Making it very easy 
for those of us who want to go and, you know, join them, which is the Republican National Convention. They're meeting in Minneapolis at the beginning of September. It's going to be a really, really fun protest. And um, they've kind of set themselves up here because they're having their meeting in what is quite possibly the most progressive city in the United States, Minneapolis. And Minneapolis and St. Paul, they're twin cities, they're separated by a river. Neither one of the cities is by itself really big enough to host a convention. St. Paul, more working class city, that's where they've put the big developments that the more middle class Minneapolis has been able to resist more successfully. So in St. Paul they have the convention center. In Minneapolis they have all the five star hotels. So as you can imagine, there's a large river separating the two cities. Thousands of Republicans will be driving in limousines each day across five, no, four bridges because one of them just collapsed due to infrastructural lack of maintenance. So there's four bridges separating Minneapolis from St. Paul. Thousands of Republicans every day crossing those bridges. And some of us in this room are going to be on those bridges. And, um, you know, it's going to be difficult for the cars and the people to be both there at the same time. So, I hope to see you there. Bring, bring, your, uh, you know, bring your bandanas, bring a little lemon and onion and vinegar. Tear gas is really not so bad. It's really exaggerated. I don't want to be macho about it. You, know, you should wash your clothes out and everything, but it really isn't so bad. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, I mean, you know, okay, if you have a heart condition or something, maybe. This is my unofficial RNC theme song. Yeah. 
just joking. Um, as the, uh, I was, uh, I mean, there's a lot of Christians in the world, and, and a lot, and, and a lot of them are, are really wonderful folks. Actually, probably most of them are. Um, but uh, here in this country, it's a mixed bag. And uh, I lived in Houston for some years, where it's a, a more of a mixed bag. And um, you know, you got your liberation theologians and Catholic workers and stuff in Houston too. But you got a lot of other people. You got these churches that have like 20 or 30 thousand people coming every Sunday to hear about like how well, everybody else is going to hell and stuff like that, and how they should give all their money to so and so. Um, and so I was in the organic vegetable section of the whole of the whole foods market in uh, Houston. And um, I was wearing my favorite t-shirt, which I used to have five of. I used to wear them on every day of the week. I'd take a break on the weekends. But it was my sociological experiment, Monday through Friday, I'd wear a picture of George Bush on my chest. And, and it had, the, in big letters, it said, International Terrorists. And um, about 15 out of 16 interactions were positive. And one in 16 was negative. And um, on the average, there were also people that walked by and gave looks that were kind of hard to decipher. But of the ones who gave like positive, like, I want to get that t-shirt, or that's wonderful, or I feel so good, or whatever, you know, there's about 15 out of 16. And then there would be occasionally, you know, like, like in the airports, for example, there would be like, all the TSA workers would be like, yeah, all right, I don't, you know, I don't like the president either. And the Starbucks workers would be like, and sometimes you'd notice like you could, you could help encourage sort of racial tension because it'd be like, okay, all the white people, are, some of the white people are thinking, I like the president, but I know that most of my, all of my coworkers of color don't, and um, I'm not sure what to say here. And so they'd stay quiet, and, and me and then all their other coworkers would be like, yeah. And, uh, but then there'd be like, inevitably, some businessman, always a white businessman in a suit, usually. In the airports, there are always white men in a suit, who would say like, you jackass, or something like that. And then clutches, uh, you know, it would always be like a G-rated, G-rated swear word. And then he'd clutch his laptop and run, you know, like, I might have it or something. But once it was uh, this elderly gentleman in the Whole Foods market, and he came up to me, and he was shaking with what I assume was rage, unless it was a medical disorder. And he was pointing at the picture of George Bush, and he was saying, he's a man of God, he's a man of God. And um, it freaked me out, and I wrote this song for him that night. <laughs>
We could spend the evening dreaming of the rising of the sun. Even when the shadows look me right in the eye, I feel your heart within my belly, like the stars up in the sky. Life is beautiful. Life is beautiful. Thank you all for coming out. You know, I was... Uh...